Welcome into the 14. This is the Wednesday edition. I'm your host, Chris Lee. There was not a Tuesday edition. That was not purposeful. We had some technical difficulties yesterday. We usually try to do this five days a week. But anyway, we took a day off, but we're back and better and more prepared than ever, Blake Lovell. Yes, we are. And uh, yeah, that was sort of a, a comedy of errors uh, sometimes in the podcasting world uh, as uh, we, we tried to call a couple of audibles yesterday with uh, trying to do a podcast. And yeah, had some technical difficulties, but uh, that's all right. That just gave us a little more time to put together uh, our notes here for what we're going to talk about today and also to set up our bracket challenge. So uh, we've got a, a bracket challenge over at ESPN and I've uh, tweeted that out on, on all of our accounts here on our 14 Southeastern on Twitter and on my personal account. So if you want to uh, join the fun there, uh, be sure to check that out. Uh, and we'll even, we'll throw a link to that uh, as well, probably in the, the podcast notes here. So. Well, I was just thinking before we started this, man, this is so exciting. We're about to have a tournament. And then the pessimistic side <laughs> kicked in <laughs> everything from the last year that nothing goes right. I'm like, man, I hope something just doesn't screw this whole thing up and we get part of the tournament canceled or there's some chaos. But I'm going to think positively today. Yep. I was in an outdoor baseball game last night uh, with the mask, but still at the game. And so that felt wonderful. And now we have basketball upon us. And I think I've said this before, back before I did sports writing, and podcasting full time, I used to take days off work. Uh, I'd get two weeks of vacation. I'd take two days just to sit at home and watch the tournament. It was worth every minute. And man, it's been two years since we had this event. And let's just hope and pray this goes off without a hitch, Blake. Yep. I mean, thus far, I guess the most notable thing has been the uh, the six referees that have been sent home uh, from the tournament. Um, Ted Valentine, I know, is one of them. Uh, and that's really was sort of the first thing that, that started, I guess, in terms of the most noteworthy stuff that's taken place thus far. And like you said, sort of, um, you know, knock on wood, that's, uh, maybe the, the extent that it gets to. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting because I think as you and I were sort of discussing, uh, going into this podcast, um, it's just one of those things where it's, you know, now we're to that point where if, if there are issues, it's forfeit and move on like that's uh, that's it there's no replacing teams now none of that uh, the bracket is set we know who's in the field and uh, yeah if there are any kind of those issues um, it will simply be a matter of uh, the team that has to forfeit uh, being out and the team they were supposed to play moving on to the next round so let's get into the games let's start in order of seeding that would mean well in order of SEC seeding that means we start with the two seed which is Alabama the Crimson Tide have a much publicized game with Iona, which if co is coached, of course, by legendary coach Rick Pitino, who coached at Kentucky and Louisville. You look at this, Blake, and I'm looking on the Ken Palm matchup, which has Alabama, I think, as a 19-point favorite. I know a lot has been made of Iona. You know, you see the 215 upset once in a blue moon, and of course it's Rick Pitino, and Iona, again, is a good program for its conference, but I'm looking at the matchup statistically. I don't see an upset here. Iona's offense is 210th. Alabama's defense is second. This is according to Ken Palm. When you go on the other side of the ball, Alabama 34th offensively, Iona 161. To me, there's a matchup in there. If a team does something particularly well or has a particular style of play, that is not conducive to the other team or like is really good on one side of the ball, right? Where you can have a hot shooting night uh, and the other team doesn't defend well, or, or you can really defend what the other team does. Well, I'm just not seeing any of this as I look at these two teams on paper. You know, I did an Iona podcast the other day. That's not something you say every day. Um, I, yeah, I, I talked with someone who covers that team and I think that was sort of what you just said was sort of what he echoed in that, Patino wants to like Patino wants to play like Alabama, but he doesn't have the roster yet to play like Alabama. Like that's eventually what he wants to get to, but he's not there yet. And so I think it's one of those things where for Iona to be successful in this game, 
they're going to have to play a style that is completely opposite of Alabama. I mean, they're not going to be able to run up and down the floor with Alabama here and be able to to win that type of game. I just don't see it happening. Um, now, look, they they do you know they shoot the three. I don't know somewhat well. I guess they're around almost thirty six percent. They're not bad from three, but they don't exactly. If you kind of look back at some of their numbers in recent games, they haven't made a ton of threes. So. I think what we've kind of seen from them is they do get some points from the free throw line. You know, twenty point eight percent of their points come from the free throw line. So that's something. And I think overall, the big stat here for me is Iona's three hundred tenth in the country in turnovers per game. They turn over fifteen point seven times per game. That's not going to work against Alabama. Um, and you know, this is by far going to be the best defensive team they played this season here in Alabama. So. I think that is something that, you know, swings in Alabama's favor here. I just don't. I'm kind of with you. Rick Pitino, I have no doubt, is going to have his team ready to play. But I just don't feel like this is the matchup. It may be two years, you know, from now if Pitino is still there and he's kind of completely revamped the roster uh, a bit. And that's not to say they don't have good players. Like Isaiah Ross, you know, 18.4 points per game. Um, you know, they've got a big kid, Nelly Jr. Joseph, who's at like 11.4 points per game, 7.6 rebounds per game. But they're just a team that I think is going to have to shoot and make a lot of threes to win here against Alabama. Uh, otherwise, I just don't see this being the type of matchup uh, that is favorable for the Gales. And another thing, I really think if you're Iona, your best bet here is to try to get Herbert Jones in foul trouble because that, that changes the dynamic of, of Alabama's defense. So that's something I think you have to focus on um, because, you know, we know how good everyone is, but Herbert Jones is just on another level when it comes to the defensive side. So there's a lot of things in Alabama's favor here, and I just I kind of look at it and, and like you and just, I don't know, I just don't see this being one that um, Iona doesn't match up very well with the Crimson Tide. Well, a few things here. I own the fouls a lot. Uh, that's not going to help. Now, they do defend the three pretty well, 23rd in the country, but we've seen Alabama, when that doesn't work, they'll just go twos and lay you up to death. And with Herb Jones and some of the athletes, that's going to be tough to defend. Your notes here, uh, you say, needs to make it a rock fight. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more because, like you said, I own a, you know, wants to play up tempo. They didn't really play that this year. They were. 203rd nationally in average possession length on offense. But in a game where you're probably going to get blown out, what you need is fewer possessions to win. And I'm with you. I, I don't, of course, the way Alabama defends, right? Like if you milk the shot clock to five, then they're really going to clamp down on you and it's hard to get a good shot. So I think you've got to take open looks when you get them. Of course, Alabama likes to play fast on offense uh, and has been very successful in doing that. So I, I just see that as hard for Iona to do as well. Well, and Iona played four games out of the conference. As we know, they had the 51-day pause or whatever it was from December to February. Um, they only played four out-of-conference games. That came against Hofstra, Morgan State, and Coppin State, and then Seton Hall was their first game of the season all the way back in November. So they just haven't really been challenged a lot, and they haven't seen a team like Alabama this season. Um, you know, And if you kind of look at how the Metro Atlantic tournament played out, they— I mean, Iona won a lot of close games to, to get to this point. Like they, you know, Sienna, they won by three. They beat Niagara by six. And they beat Fairfield by nine in the championship game. So um, I think that's that's something of note, too. This this is one where I think the Patino factor makes this game more intriguing than it should be if both teams kind of play the way that we think they're going to. Um, I just feel like that's, that's the thing. Is it's going to magnify, I think, people. You'll see people pick Iona to pull the upset here just because of Patino. But if you actually look at the matchup overall, I see no reason why Alabama can't win this game convincingly. Yeah, right at Nink, Alabama advances to the round of 32. Well, Alabama fans are not happy with you because you just pulled the ultimate jinx and uh, they are out. So we'll see. That, that state's something to manage, isn't it? Because you got <laughs> half of them that think you're an Auburn fan and the yeah. other half thinks you're an Alabama fan. Listen, Is that pretty accurate? I know Hunter Johnson is listening to this podcast right now. And let me tell you, the fact that you just said right at Nink, Alabama's advancing. Hunter is about to just sit here and give me a call. He's going to text me and say, what are you doing pulling the jinx on us? Um, no, I, I mean, it's it's funny. that That's what I said, and that's something I pointed out, too, after the SEC championship game. It's so interesting, isn't it, that I remember like four or five years ago, 
I when I you know I started doing the SEC basketball stuff just primarily focusing on and of course at that time you know no one's looking at SEC basketball and spending a lot of time on it and all this other stuff but um, you know everyone kept saying no one in Alabama like no one cares about basketball it's awful but I don't care if they win or lose no one's caring about basketball and it's just so opposite now like Alabama fans are just they're all in you know Auburn fans the same way UAB fans have got Andy Kennedy there he's already off to a good start. Um, I just think it was uh, so sort of, I don't know, it does a disservice to, I think, uh, basketball fans in the state of Alabama. Yes, winning helps, but uh, overall, I think these are fan bases all, all over the place that have just been hungry to win. And, you know, now we're seeing that in Alabama. Now we're seeing it uh, at Auburn. So uh, it, it's very interesting. And just, just for to add to the to the mojo here, as we talk about this, there is a thunderstorm rolling through. So I don't know if that's a good vibe either uh, for uh, Alabama after you said what you said. So. Yeah, I'm hearing it where I am too, and we're we're <laughs> several miles apart here. But well, I don't know. That uh, that may be trying to tell you something. That's uh, our omen. Not good. Okay, let me take a sidebar for a minute because everything that you just said about people in Alabama don't care about basketball. I used to hear that about SEC baseball and college baseball constantly. Yeah, and now it's not on the same plane with the NCAA tournament, obviously, and obviously also interest has peaked during tournament time, right? So there is that. But I think that sometimes with media, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Like, yeah, well, we're not going to cover it because nobody's interested. Well, nobody's interested because they don't know about it. Right. Um, or, or not nobody, but fewer people. So I'm in, I'm anxious to see, like, especially as college baseball is, is televised more. And you can see, I mean, if, if you want to watch Louisiana Monroe and Illinois Chicago, on a on yeah. a Tuesday now, you can probably get it on ESPN Plus, right? Right. And yeah. look at SEC women's softball. I think that's really taken off in popularity because it's on TV. So I do wonder how much the SEC network, because when was that form? Was that 14, yeah, 15? Yeah, it's been a while now. Yeah. But I do wonder if there's a little bit of a lag effect. And, of course, it helps that both those schools hired tremendous coaches so I'm not going to say that's not a factor, but I do wonder now that everything is on more because like 10, 12 years ago, like if your team was playing on the road in the SEC, you know, you might catch them on TV, but there was a maybe as good or better chance you're listening on the radio. So I do wonder how much several years of coverage has helped, especially when kids grow up getting to watch their team on TV and everything, too. Well, and here's the argument that doesn't work. And I, I've seen this before. It's like, well, it's, no, it's never going to be to the level of football. Of course it's not. Like, basketball seats, what, 15,000? Football stadiums seat 100,000 100, plus? Like, of course it's not going to be to the extent of football. Like, that doesn't mean, though, that it doesn't deserve coverage and that people don't care just because there's not 100,000 people that would fill into, you know, an arena if that size was there to be able to watch a basketball game. So I think that's just, uh, yeah, to, to me it's it's an interesting discussion, but uh, that's what I said. I, I think you see, I mean, Alabama won the SEC tournament title this year, of course, won the regular season title too. Auburn, the last tournament champion before that. Um, and you just see it like these. Uh, and, and it also shows, I think, too, how how coaches can revitalize programs the way that, you know, Nate Oates and Bruce Pearl have in those specific programs in general. So, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that, that's something I, I did bring up. And I think a lot of people kind of latched on to that because it's true. I mean, it's just uh, one of those things where and I've always said it, you know, SEC basketball, there have always been fans there. And, and I think as you you have more success, of course, most more people are going to be interested. But, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, doing it a disservice thing that uh, no one cares. So. I think that's where Mike Slive was a great commissioner, having the vision to start the network and televise all these things. And, of course, you see what happens with the paychecks. I mean, they were, what, $43 million a year per yeah. school, and, and now it's going to be like $30 million in addition to that. So it's, it's going to be in the 70s. Uh, you know, a lot of that's driven by TV, if not most of it. And I just think that you tend to be more interested in what you know about, right? Like when I'm really following Major League Baseball, the playoffs become more interesting and I think that's the case, too, with all these things. I just think now that it's more accessible and uh, for people to watch and, and see that it's a great product, they're going to be more interested in the postseason. And my, my goodness, uh, that Alabama fan base is is, is dialed in. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll hear about my prediction later. So. Yeah, we will see if it is correct. So, Okay, I don't think I would write Arkansas and Colgate and Inc. In, in fact— Ken Palm agrees with me. He's got Arkansas, a 78% favorite to win this one. Uh, 83-75 is Ken Palm's prediction. 
computer generated prediction in this. And as I said, and you've said, Colgate should have never been a 14 seed. It, it should have been, I think, a 12. By the way, did you get a chance to listen to Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish on I, their podcast this week? I haven't yet. No, not yet. They were, and of course, we did ours before I heard theirs, but they were taking the committee to task on seeding. They weren't as in-depth on the SEC, but they agreed with this. They just they couldn't make sense of where some of these teams were seeded either. Oklahoma State was one that they had a particular problem with which a lot of people did, but we were not alone in our criticism of the committee. And this is a game where I think you said this on Sunday night when we did our pod, if Arkansas were to lose this, I think there's going to be a lot of revisionist history is not the phrase, but a lot of looking back and saying the committee did them no favors. And if that happened, I would certainly agree. Yeah, I think so too. And um, like we said, and I get it. I mean, we, we did say that too. Like it's hard to figure out what to do with the team that played 15 games this season. But I think again, that's where you have to sort of add some extra elements into that, knowing that you were going to be in that spot as a committee, there were going to be some of these situations like this. Um, So I don't know. That's, that's one that, that I think is going to be interesting, um, you know, because I, I've said it. Like, Colgate's, a, they're a good team. Um, if you just look at their numbers, like, which, again, you always have to keep in the perspective of this team did only play 15 games. They didn't play a non-conference schedule. And, by the way, they played one, two, three. They only played three teams during the regular season. Think about that. Like, they played four games against Army, four games against Boston, Four games against Holy Cross. Like, that was their entire regular season. Three teams, like three opponents. That's it. And then they played Boston again in the Patriot Tournament. They played Bucknell and Loyola. So they've only played five teams this season of their 15 games. Um, So I get why it was a little difficult, but still, I think if you just look at it from a basketball standpoint, their numbers, yes, are very, you know, impressive. When you look at it, they're in the top five an effective field goal percentage, turnover percentage, and three-point percentage. Um, they're the number one team in the country when it comes to defending the three. But I, I think those, you have to sort of look at it in the bubble that they they played in, um, in terms of they haven't seen a team like Arkansas this year, not even close. And I think that's something that, that we can see Arkansas use as advantage. But I don't want to take away from the fact that even all that I just said – this is still a good team. Now, if they played an entire normal regular season schedule, would their, would their numbers be as good? Probably not. But they're going to get up and down the floor. They play a very fast pace. Um, they're going to shoot you know, pretty efficiently, like we said. I mean, in a lot of different areas. Like They're good in a lot of areas on offense. Uh, but I think this is one to where Arkansas can really use its size to be able to dominate a game like this. Uh, and really overwhelm one of these teams like Colgate. But this is the one thing I always go back to with these games. You don't want to let these kind of teams hang around that shoot the ball as well as they shoot it. Because when you get into those close games, they've got a lot of different guys that can make shots. Um, You've got five players who pretty much are right near that double figures line in scoring. Jordan Burns does everything for them. 17 points, five assists, four rebounds, two steals. Um, that's, that's something that I would look at here because I, I feel like that's going to determine it. If, if Arkansas lets them hang around, let's say we go into halftime, Arkansas is up three or four or something. And then as you play out the second half, they're still keeping it within five. And it's just kind of one of those things. That's where I start to get a little nervous if I'm Arkansas, but I think they should be able to come out and use, you know, Moses Moody, Jalen Tate, um, JD Note, those guys I think can overwhelm. Uh, them Colgate in terms of just having more size, having a, more athleticism. Uh, but uh, this it's still an intriguing matchup to me, I think, no matter what. Yeah, the three-point numbers, offense and defense, as you said, are, are things that you know send chills up my spine a little bit if I'm an Arkansas fan. And turnovers, too. They like, I think you mentioned this. They take care of the ball. They turn it over 13.7% of the time. Arkansas likes to force those, get some easy buckets and transition. So, I think two keys to upsets are do you not give the favorites some easy opportunities? Colgate generally does not do that. And can you shoot the eyes out of the three? Uh, Colgate can do that. Now, like you said, this is a completely litmus test because they haven't played anything like Arkansas. Like, I'm going to look back last year. This team is kind of middle of the pack in experience. Colgate was 25-9 and nine last year. And yeah, they got blown lost, out, like blown out Auburn. by Auburn. Yeah. yeah, they lost all those games pretty badly. So I guess that makes you feel a little better if you're an Arkansas fan. But 
hey, it's one game, you never know, right? You, you see teams all the time, you know, that, that show up in the tournament for one game that's so out of character for what they played the rest of the season, and that's impossible to predict. But I, I like Arkansas to advance. I just wish that it got a different 14 seed. Yeah, I agree. I think, like I said, they're they're a dangerous team because of how they play. And that's what we talk about with the styles. You need a team, if you're going to find an upset, you feel like you need a team that unless they can just really match up well with the team they're playing, they need sort of a different style and they need the numbers to support them potentially pulling off the upset. And Colgate has both of those. Uh, But I just, again, like you said, I don't think this is uh, one of those things where even though this team has literally, I mean, they haven't lost a game since January the 3rd. So we're talking about two and a half months here since uh, their only loss of the season. Um, but that, you know, that's something else like that confidence and momentum. That's, you know, that's pretty priceless. And when you enter a tournament setting like this, but I don't know, I just, I just think Arkansas, as you said, if, if Arkansas plays like it should, um, this, this should be a game that I think Arkansas wins. Uh, I don't want to say pretty handily because I don't want to suggest it's going to be like 25 plus points or anything. Uh, I think the lines actually moved down to like eight and a half or something, which, if I'm a better, I'd let that thing keep moving because I think it's going to keep moving down a bit uh, because a lot of people are jumping on Colgate here. But, uh, I, yeah, I'm with you. I think Arkansas should win. Well, here's where something comes into play that we have mentioned at various times. Arkansas has a ton of parts and a lot of different kinds of parts. And some nights they use those parts and some nights they don't. Great example, Connor Vanover. Some yeah. nights he's one of the two or three most important players on the floor for them. Other nights he plays five minutes like he did against LSU. Vanover's a kid that I think really potentially gives Colgate problems in this game. Like you said, height would be a concern. Uh, Desi Sills, another guy, like he played four minutes last time, but a couple games before that he hits five three-pointers. So I think this is a spot where if you're Eric Musselman, you're going, we got got a lot of different parts we can use. I mean, Moses Moody is is kind of the constant there. I guess Smith and Davis and, and Tate sort of too, but if something is working or not working, he's got a lot of other options to go to. And I think that's the thing. Like, if you want a little bit of insurance on this game, if you're an Arkansas fan, that's kind of the first place that I look. Yep, they can play a lot of different ways. And uh, I think, like you said, it's just, I, I don't know. I, I look at, the more I look at this matchup, I just think that this is one where you sh- you should see Arkansas sort of take care of business here and not really mess around I think and that's what I said it's, I, I think some of these games are really so important and, and they're almost I think some of them in the NCAA tournament are decided like in that first half of the first half because it's it's how you see a team come out and does the better team just come out and completely you know play and maybe overwhelm the 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 underdog because we see that so many times it's like and that's the ones I think if you look at the upsets it's usually where you let a team hang around for a long time, but if you come out and kind of, you know, can overwhelm them a little bit early, then that confidence starts to slip a little bit if you're the underdog and you came in all lamped up thinking, hey, you know, we're going to be able to do this. And I think that's what Arkansas has to do. I really think that first 10 minutes of that game is going to be very important for Arkansas because if you give this team some confidence uh, in Colgate and they're knocking down threes, then things get substantially dip more difficult. Um, so I, I think that's that to me is the one thing I'm watching uh, here in this game. You know, we spent a lot of time on Arkansas talking about Moody, of course, and and some of the other guys that step up and have big games. I would not realized how consistent Justin Smith had been for Arkansas lately. Oh, yeah. No, he's uh, – I mean, that's why I think a lot of people were trying to figure out why he wasn't an all-SEC type player. Um, you know, he, he kind of really just came on in terms of uh, all the things he did. Really, and, and again, I mean, that's that's what Muss has done is he finds these guys that are older, and, you know, we know we, we laugh about the transfers and, and him finding someone from everywhere all the time and always being in the mix for transfers. But, like, he – more often than not, like, he finds the guys that, that fit how that, you know, he wants to play. And, and J.D. Note, who sat out last year, comes in this year, and now Justin Smith, who's just been pretty rock solid for them – the entire way in SEC play. I mean, really, this guy scored nine or more points uh, in every SEC game he's played in since uh, that game against uh, Alabama where he scored five. Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, he, he's been very impressive. And so I just, Arkansas has a lot of different ways they can beat you, and, and I think that's one thing they have to their advantage here. Well, more than the points, it's the minutes to me. He's playing, gosh, over the last month, he's averaging – I, I don't have the math in front of me, or I don't have the calculation, but he's averaging over 35 minutes a game the last month, which is incredible. 
um, given as many options as they have. But th- that's another thing that just sticks out the bat. He's he's kind of a big, um, more of a wing slash power forward type player, I guess, than anything. Uh, he's not not an outside shooter. But a- again, we, with the team that's got issues with height. Um, I think he's a piece that, that works pretty well in this game, too. Yep, should play to their advantage. And, uh, yeah, I just I, I feel pretty good about Arkansas as long as they come out and get off to a good start here. Okay, so we're going to send Arkansas on to the round of 32. What about Tennessee and Oregon State? Well, that's an interesting one. Uh, we always talk about the 5-12 matchups. I think, you know, Oregon State's another team that I think a lot of people will be kind of latching on to based on how they finish the season, um, you know, not not just winning the Pac-12 tournament, but, uh, you know, they, they also won the Pac-12 tournament, beating three teams in this field, UCLA, Oregon, and Colorado. Um, but, you know, overall, I think this is uh, certainly sets up as one of your rock fight games. Uh, Oregon State is not going to play fast. Uh, they Their tempo, you know, they, they just tend to slow things down a bit in terms of, uh, you know, what, what they do offensively. But Ethan Thompson's really good. Um, he's someone that I think if you're Tennessee fans, obviously you're going to be locked in on him because he kind of makes everything go. For Oregon State, uh, Jared Lucas, he's the three-point specialist. He averages around 13 a game, but uh, he can really shoot it. So those are the two guys I would probably have my eye on if I'm a Tennessee fan looking at this. Um, you know, the thing that Oregon State does have is this is a team that has some size, and, and that's where I think the John Fulkerson thing comes into to effect here because – I mean, again, I'm not playing, you know, doctor or anything, but I don't know, man. I I just, for some reason, I have a hard time seeing Fulkerson playing uh, in this game. I could be completely wrong. I just, I don't know the way, and I don't know, I mean, look, Tennessee playing, that game's on Saturday, right? So that gives them an an extra day, I think, uh, to be able to, or no, actually, you know what? They play Friday. I got my days mixed up. Um, So yeah, maybe that's also not great uh, in terms of, uh, you know, when they play too. But I think they need Fulkerson in a game like this because I think his size would help kind of combat some of the size for Oregon State. Not an experienced team, the Beavers. Uh, they're not really great on either side, I wouldn't say. You know, they're not an elite team on, on one side or the other. I just think they're sort of a case of a team that gets hot at the right time. And it doesn't matter what you do throughout the season. It's as long as you're hot at the right time, um, that's all that matters. So that, to me, you know, is a little bit dangerous for the Vols because, uh, you know, uh, elsewhere, Oregon State really, I mean, they haven't beat a lot of good teams this year. And so outside of just the Pac-12 tournament, but again, it doesn't really matter as a whole uh, because they're beating good teams at the right time. So I- I'm curious about this one. Um, I think if Tennessee plays the way they should, which we don't know, uh, I think Tennessee's just a better team. But I think Fulkerson's uh, status is-, is something certainly worth watching. I trust Tennessee to win this game. Though the experience thing scares me because this is a fairly veteran Oregon State team that's coming in on a roll and confidence. But I'm thinking if I'm Rick Barnes, and this is kind of what happened in the Alabama game, I don't think Pond, Springer, Keon Johnson, or Vescovi come off the floor much at all. Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, Springer and Johnson played a ton of minutes. They're used to it. Pond's played 39 against Alabama. Uh, that's going to help against the height. Um, this is where they need a Victor Bailey or a Josiah Jordan James, uh, who frankly had one of the more disappointing seasons of anybody in the conference to really step up. Bailey now has been that guy um, a lot for them lately. I think they've got enough, but boy, the bench, you know, once you get to, you know, seven, eight, and nine, and they didn't use those guys a lot, they used Plavsic some against Alabama because Fulkerson was out. He didn't play that well. But I, I think that's when foul trouble kind of becomes maybe more important for Tennessee, that and endurance. So, and looking at it, those guys did a pretty good job of staying on the floor for Tennessee. So that does make me feel a little bit better in, in terms of Tennessee getting a win here. Well, let's think about the numbers here. Oregon State finished 91 in, in the net, 85 in Ken Palm. So, like, this isn't a team that would have – been in the conversation at all had they not won this tournament so uh, that's not to take anything away from because again it doesn't really matter what you do the entire season it only matters what you do now and, and they earn their way here but you know if you just play the averages like Tennessee should win this game because they have been the more consistent team throughout this entire regular season and into the postseason whereas you know Oregon State again just kind of made a run here and managed to put some things together. But I, I don't know. I, this is one that's sort of uh, interesting, I think, overall, in terms of uh, what 
you could see here because I, I we, we go back to Tennessee. Like we've had our frustrations with them, but I think if we see the Tennessee we saw in the SEC tournament, which there's no guarantees you will, I think they should win this game, you know, potentially by double digits. Although I think for Tennessee, picking them to beat anyone by double digits with the offense sometimes is not a good good thing to do. But I think their defense can can really sort of uh, may really play a role here and maybe just really slow down an Oregon State team. That quite frankly, um, as we said, it's a game where I think for Oregon State there, there's not going to be a ton of possessions. Um, so if Tennessee's defense locks in, I, I could see them, you know, holding this kind of team to in the 50s somewhere probably. So. Well, the funny thing about Tennessee is the Vols had their worst three-game stretch of basketball probably the season. February 20th, loses by 15 at home to Kentucky, goes to Vandy the following Wednesday and wins by 12, but that was like a two- or three-point game in the final minute and a half, and that was Vanderbilt without the Sue and Pippen. Goes to Auburn and loses to an Auburn team without Sharif Cooper, then turns around and plays maybe its best back-to-back-to-back games of the year, uh, two wins over Florida and then a win over Alabama, and, of course, Fulkerson not in it. So there is that. You know, part of us, we've kind of held on to this hope all year that maybe Tennessee figures it out just in time. It feels like the Vols were kind of starting to do that, but the Fulkerson thing uh, is just the one flying the ointment here. That and, of course, the draw we talked about. I just think that uh, I don't know that there was a team in the field that got a worse eight-team part of the bracket than Tennessee did. The path to the lead eight is is darn near impossible. But anyway, Ken Palm's got this as a 26% chance of Oregon State pulling an upset. But, of course, I, I think that factors in Fulkerson being on the floor – which, again, may or may not be an issue here. Yeah, this is a wait-and-see kind of game for me to kind of judge until we know if Fulkerson's playing. And then I think from there, then you have a little bit better of an idea. Uh, I mean, look, and we've talked about with Fulkerson, too. Like, he's been up and down. But I still think that with him on the floor, I, I feel like he would be able to to really make a difference in a game like this. Uh, but, you know, even if he is on the floor, you know, what percent is he and that kind of stuff. So I'm curious to see kind of what that looks like uh, before they tip off uh, there on Friday. I'm still taking Tennessee either way. Are you? Yeah, I think Tennessee. Again, I think Tennessee's the better team overall, so I, I would take Tennessee in this spot. Florida, Virginia Tech. Ken Palm has got this one nearly a toss-up. He's got Florida winning 69-68, a 56% chance of victory. I don't think either of us are crazy about either team in this matchup. What do we know about Virginia Tech? Well, Cavaluma is uh, a very good player. Um, he is someone that I think, you know, if you're a Tennessee fan, he is, or excuse me, if you're a Florida fan, um, he's someone you keep your eye on because he is, you know, very good at 15.6 points per game, eight rebounds per game. He can affect the game in a lot of different ways. Um, but, you know, it's not just him for the Hokies either. And I think that's something here that I would probably have a little concern if I'm Florida. They have five players that average at least 9.2 points per game. So I, here's what I like about that for any team. You know, in the NCAA tournament, it's it's win or go home. And so if your best player were to have, you know, a, a bad game at the wrong time, you need to have other guys that can step up. And so I like the fact – for Virginia Tech, that they have, you know, that many guys that are almost close to that double-digit mark in scoring. Um, so I think that's something that you kind of look at with the Hokies and say, well, you know, if Luma doesn't have his best game, then, hey, you've got other guys who can step up. Um, I, I don't know about this one. I think this is, to me, this feels like, you know, an 8-9 type game because it's just such a toss-up in terms of maybe what we could see from both teams here. Um, if you look at how Virginia Tech wants to play, they're going to want to slow the game down down a bit more than Florida will want to. Um, you know, and, and I think that's something that, I don't know, like that could be something that really, I think, plays in, in Mike Young's favor in terms of having Virginia Tech run their offense and be able to really kind of grind out a game like this. Um, one thing that you can note just from looking at the stats on this game, uh, Virginia Tech does get a good chunk of their points from the three-point line uh but that is somewhere that that florida's been really good this season in terms of the three-point field goal defense um i think they're in the top 30 still in the country in that so that is kind of what i look like uh what you look like uh when you look at this game um because there's a lot of different things i, I think that i could convince you one way or the other um and it does feel like a 50 50 type of game with these two teams um so this was uh, probably you know if you look at all these games, 
I think this one's probably the most unpredictable for me. Maybe, I, I mean, we're going to get to the one next that I, I would certainly put right there with it, but I, this is very unpredictable because, I, I, you know, Trey Mann's really good, but sometimes Florida's been up and down. Virginia Tech, I mean, there's a reason they're a 10 seed. Um, you know, they haven't been great either, but I, I really don't know what to expect from this game, to be honest with you. The wild card for me for Florida, and I'd still like to know what happened here, is Scotty Lewis. Because that kid, early part of the year, and especially after Keontae Johnson got hurt, was really key to what they did. And now you're seeing the guy that most nights plays half the time, some nights less. And Tyree Appleby has kind of been that other guy outside of Castleton and Trey Mann who has stepped up and can give you 15 on a lot of nights. But Lewis, I thought, was such an effective defender for them early in the conference season. I don't know what's going on there, but like to me, he is the X factor. Like if you get the Scotty Lewis that we saw for a while back in January, then all of a sudden the Gators, to me, uh, that's a team. You know, we said we didn't think they deserved a seven. I thought they were more like a nine. But I think if Lewis plays at that level, then then they are more like a a seven, maybe even a six. So to me, it'll be interesting to see how he plays in this one. Yeah, I agree because uh, I mean they're look they're gonna have to defend because I, I think you know like you said with Virginia Tech, they're not a bad team. I mean I I think that's something that to point out here. I mean uh, they have beaten Virginia this year. Um, you know they've beaten Clemson, who's also in the field. They beat Villanova in overtime back in November. Um, this is a team that's, you know, pretty good and, and they've, they've got some things they can do, like you said, and I really like their balance and what they're able to do offensively. And I think that's going to be the area for Florida. I mean, Florida is a team that since Mike White's been there, we've always kind of looked at the defense, maybe a little bit ahead of the offense at times. And I think that's going to need to be the case here because I, I think Virginia Tech offensively can really put some things together and, and make it really hard on you defensively. And that's like you said, you need guys like that. that can step up. Um, and be able to, to do some different things. So I, I'm very curious with this one. I think this is, you know, I don't know if this is going to be the game that gets all the, the pub and everything in terms of one of the best first-round games, but at least for me, I find that it's one of the more, more intriguing first-round matchups just because I think there's a lot of different directions uh, you could see this one go in. Yeah, I don't have a good sense of who to pick here. Do you? I don't. I think this is uh, really, I mean, this is a pick em. If you look at a lot of the, yeah. the sports books, like the, it is, like it's a pick em. Florida started as a one-point favorite. It's a pick em now, and and I can't disagree with that. I think this is a toss-up in terms of uh, what you could see. And I think also, to to add to the fact that this is the first game on the board, um, it's just, you know, those early games in the NCAA tournament, those are always, uh, to me, can be the most fascinating because, uh, man, it, it can kind of set the course for what's to come. And uh, Florida and Virginia Tech, first game, Arkansas, Colgate, the second game. So uh, there you go. Yeah, I think I'm going to need another day to think this one over. Yeah, this is, uh, we'll talk more about this one in the lead up. So, You know, I, I kind of feel the same way about the next one, too. LSU and St. Bonaventure, you and I have kind of been on opposite sides of LSU all year. Um. Uh, although you look to be the one with the more correct take <laughs> last week in Nashville, for sure. <laughs> well, I think I would put this to me. Now, I need to go through the entire bracket, and I, I've kind of done this in terms of ranking the games, but I think this is a top three first-round game in the tournament. I think this one could be that good. Um, now, as you know, you know what I'm going to say. It can be that good if LSU that showed up uh, at the SEC tournament shows up because if that team shows up, I think that team's good enough to win multiple games here. Um, and we will talk more about that as we go along. But I, I think this is going to be a lot of fun because these are two teams that, like, if you want to, if you're looking for bench play, go find another game because these are two teams that are going to play their starters or their their you know LSU will play its big four St. Bonaventure is going to play its five starters by the way the Bonnies five starters play 33 plus minutes per game so that kind of tells you something there um they're not going to their bench a whole lot you're going to see like the stars going up against the stars for the entire 40 minutes or more in this game um so I think this is a this is such a fun matchup St. Bonaventure um a very good defensive team they have experience um one thing here and I'm going to tell you right now if you want to mark one stat 
that is going to define for one of these SEC teams. Here it is. St. Bonaventure is really good at getting second chance opportunities on the offensive glass. LSU really, really struggles at giving up offensive rebounds. And so if LSU comes out and, and sort of can, can dedicate itself on the glass, I think LSU is going to win this game. If they don't, and I think St. Bonaventure is probably going to win and be able to really rack up a lot of second chance points here. Uh, but I, I love this matchup. Uh, I'm just like, you know, people are probably listen saying, man, he is really just gushing over this game. I, you know, watch it be like 48 to 43 or something. But I don't expect that. I think this is going to be one of the best games of the first round because you have one of the most efficient offensive teams in the country going up against one of the most efficient defensive teams in the country in St. Bonaventure. Of course, LSU on the offensive side. Uh, this this should be great. I, I really am looking forward to this one. It's almost as if LSU has an attention to details issue on the defensive end of the floor with that, that yeah. rebounding stat, Blake. That's fair. Almost like that, isn't it? Yeah, um, that's that's fair. Well, I will turn the tables on, on this a little bit. St. Bonaventure's defense, obviously they're tremendous, and the ranking again in that, let me let me look this up. They're 17th in adjusted defensive efficiency, but I've watched LSU play – these elite defensive teams, you, you saw it against Alabama. In, in, in the February matchup in Tuscaloosa, they struggled, but they get 79 against Alabama and Nashville. Yep. They get uh, six, 78 against Tennessee in Baton Rouge on February the 13th. I mean, they, they go and blister Auburn, which is not a good defensive team, but they get 104 against the Tigers. I mean, they're scoring. I'm looking down the list. You know, Ole Miss. Very, very good, outstanding defensive team. They get 78 against the Rebels in Nashville, you know, on a neutral floor where Ole Miss has a ton to play for. I think that St. Bonaventure's, Bonaventure's defensive uh, rating here is is neutralized a little bit because LSU was so lead on offense. I think that the Bonnies, you know, some, some teams, in other words, you're effective against most teams, but once you reach a guy that that can punch harder than anybody you're playing, um, th- that guy's going to win more than he loses. I guess my point is LSU's offense has been so potent that even the best defensive teams in the country that stop almost everybody else have not been able to really stop LSU, if that makes sense. Well, that's the point we made with Ole Miss when we were kind of predicting our SEC tournament bracket was we said, even a team like Ole Miss, it's good defensively. LSU is going to find a way to score, and they've they've proven that. Like they they may give up eighty five, but they're probably still going to find a way to score eighty four. And so, uh, in any way you slice it, like I think LSU is going to put up points because as we've we've just seen it too many times um, overall. But but I mean I, I agree. Look, if LSU comes out and plays the way they should they should win this game. But I also think St. Bonaventure is a pretty good team offensively. And and one of the things that, again, is the strength of St. Bonaventure is you do have a team that has a nucleus that has played, you know, in the in together. Like you've got those five starters that have played so many minutes together this year, that chemistry is there. You could say the same thing for LSU, but I would also argue that with LSU, it's been a little bit more rocky at times uh, in terms of, you know, as we've said, we, we, they may still score points, but sometimes they come out and you just don't know what you're going to get from them. Um, so I, I, I'm really looking forward to this one. I, I think this should be a, a really good game. You know, you got two teams that have some, some really good talent that are going to be able to, I think, match up really well with each other. Um, it's just I don't think you know what you're getting from LSU. If if you get the team that was motivated with the chip on, on his shoulder that we saw in Nashville, I think LSU wins. Um, if you don't, then I think St. Bonaventure could attack them on the offensive glass and put up enough points uh, to, to really make this thing uh, pretty interesting. And, and by the way, this is a complete clash of styles. Uh, LSU, 47th average offensive possession length, 16.1 seconds. Uh, St. Bonaventure, 323rd, 19 seconds. So who will be able to dictate the style? Uh, that is also going to be something I think that really comes into play here. Okay, I had almost talked myself into picking LSU in this game because th- <laughs> the defense seemed like it's been better. I go back and look. They give up 1.11 points of possession against Ole Miss, 0.96 against Arkansas, then 1.16 against Alabama. So what do you make of that? Yeah, that's, again, like they're <laughs> – it is what it is. Like they're they're not a different offensive team. They we can look at the numbers and say, all right, they defend the three well, and that's great. But 
they're, to me, they're still the defensive team we've seen all season. I just don't really. And, and here's the thing. LSU's best defensive numbers, right, is defending the three. St. Bonaventure does not get many other points from the three-point line. They're a team that's going to score a lot from inside the arc. So that's another thing that I worry about a little bit with LSU. Here's another thing. St. Bonaventure hasn't played anybody as good as no. LSU yet. No, they like have the, the, the A-10 was like like the NIT this year, right? And, and it's almost a good way to put it. Um, you know, you had VCU and they made it. St. Louis had an argument but didn't. I think that was the right decision to let the, leave those guys out of the tournament, but it was close. Um, gosh, the rest of that league wasn't as good as I thought it would be. Fordham was awful. St. Joe's was awful. Um, Rhode Island, which I thought would be better. Richmond, which I thought would be better. Uh, both those disappointed. Dayton took a huge step back. So, I don't know. That's the other thing is LSU is used to winning this type of game. And with St. Bonaventure, we really just don't know. I think the best offensive team that St. Bonaventure played this year would have been Davidson. Um, sort of like LSU, a very efficient type team. Do it in a completely different way. I think say, I think Davidson was actually towards the very bottom in terms of how they play. We know how Bob McKillop's teams play. They're going to be sort of a, more of a methodical type of team. Um, and, you know, again, compare all you want, but St. Bonaventure held Davidson in back-to-back -back games to 58 points and 53 points um, so with their defense. So I, it's, it's the best offensive team they played this season, and that's what we say. I, I think it's it's so hard to predict how these games are going to play out, and I think it's even more hard to predict when you have a team like LSU that you've seen what they're capable of, but you've also seen that they're a team that's capable of giving up 90-something even to – you know, maybe teams that you, or, ordinarily you don't really view as a team that's great. I mean, look, they gave up 91 against Georgia. Um, you know, those are the kind of things that worry me with LSU, even though I think it's pretty clear that if you just look at it in a vacuum, LSU's played some of its best basketball in its past probably four or five games than, than it has all season. So that's a trend that's in the, you know, heading in the right direction for, for them coming into this game. And I think it's just can they find that same motivation, that same mindset they had coming into the SEC tournament. If they can, I think they win this game. And uh, I, quite frankly, I think they can win the next game. Uh, if they don't, I could just as easily see them losing to St. Bonaventure here. Gosh, the A-10 was really a poor offensive league this year. I didn't realize it until I started looking at this. Yeah. Uh, St. Louis was probably the best offensive team in the league outside of St. Bonaventure Davidson. They hold St. Louis to 59. But again, I, I don't know that that's a uh, Listen, nobody I don't in the think A10 that's a comp that carries over. Yeah. <laughs> nobody in the ATN has Cam Thomas, Trenton Wofford, Javante Smart, and Darius Days. Like, as we said, we those are four of the best players in the SEC. Um, you know, I mean, Bones Highland, really good for VCU. You could probably throw him in that same kind of mix. And there are other guys in there I'm sure I'm forgetting as well. But overall, like they are they have not faced a team that can overwhelm you offensively the way that LSU can. Um, so that that is something that I think is in LSU's favor here. All right, you've talked me into this, and I'm about to give LSU the kiss to death. Oh, the wow. Next round. Look at that. You, you didn't go. think I was going to do that, did you? No, I thought you were going to. I did not, but I, I am I too. didn't think I was going to do that either. <laughs> we, we really sound like a Homer podcast right here, but uh, by the way, we're just playing. We've played to the seating to this point in terms of uh, who we're picking, although we haven't picked the Florida-Virginia Tech game yet, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel pretty good about LSU here. Um, I just, I find it hard to believe that St. Bonaventure is going to be able to hold them in that 50 type, you know, low 60 type range. Although they could, if they control the tempo, it really could. And I think that could frustrate LSU to no end to where I think St. Bonaventure, I actually say that I think St. Bonaventure is the type of team that can really frustrate LSU. Like because the way they play, LSU wants to get up and down the court. They don't want to play defense for 25 seconds. Uh, those kind of things. So, that worries me a little bit, but if we just go based on what we've seen, if I'm just going to go and assume that the LSU we saw in the SEC tournament is going to be maybe not the exact same, but somewhat similar, and I think in that situation, they're better than St. Bonaventure. Well, look, it may sound like a Homer podcast, and if people want to level that criticism, then, then fine. I don't really care, but look, the SEC, here's the people that need to hear this. This was a good league this year, Blake. It was the third best league in the country, according to Ken Pomeroy. And I think he's right. As I go through and look at these leagues, it was definitely better than the ACC this year. It was better than the Big East. I mean, now, Big Ten and Big 12 are ahead of them. And Ken Palm's got it closer to the Big 12 uh, th than I probably would have gone. But that's that's also based on 
the team that's expected to go 500 in league play. The Big 12 was weird this year because Kansas State and Iowa State were just abysmal. Yeah. Uh, which Iowa State's coach got fired in the process, by the way. Um, but let me give you a comparison here, okay? According to Ken Palm's ratings, um, the SEC was miles better than the A-10. Eighth best conference, but you look at the ratings, the difference between the SEC and the A-10 is about like the difference between the A-10 and Conference USA, which is pretty significant. Yeah. Actually, actually, it's more than that. Um, goodness, it's, it's almost like that. Well, there's a big drop off between Conference USA and the Big West, and I'm rambling here. But my, my point is, the league was really good. For some reason, there's this myth about the SEC that it was down or whatever. It's just not true. And as I look at this, um, LSU with all its faults, it's got talent. And I just think the competition it faced prepares it for this game better than v, than than St. Bonaventure. No fault to St. Bonaventure's good team has my respect, but that's why I have come over to your side of this. <laughs> I think that's the thing with the SEC is all these teams at their best, the six teams in the SEC, I think they're all top six seeds when they play at their best. Like, I think that's that's the way you could probably look at it. Um, I think when, when these teams are playing the way we know that they're capable of playing, they're all good enough, I think, to be top six, top five, maybe even type seats. Like, I really believe that. Um, of course, you're not going to see that with every game. I don't think you're going to see every team play like that. But um, we, we know kind of what the potential is with some of these teams, and that's what's frustrated at times because some of these teams haven't met that potential throughout the entire season. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm going LSU here. I, I feel a bit better about it. But, uh, look, as I said, I'm, I'm also not going to sit here and say that I'm 100% confident or even 75% confident maybe just because um, I want to make sure that the LSU team – that has the chip on its shoulder, it's going to show up and not the one that's going to get really frustrated by how St. Bonaventure likes to play. Well, let me give you a good example, too. This will speak to our people in the part of the country. The difference between the SEC and the A-10 was greater than the difference between the A-10 and the SOCON. Yeah. So. And and it wasn't really that close. So I think people can, can understand that one a little better. I, I just think people aren't giving the league enough credit. So... Um, all right, we're both taking LSU, Missouri, Oklahoma. I have a feeling you and I are going to fall on the same side on this one, too, and it's going to go a little differently than it has. I have, listen, you talk about a game that I have no idea. I don't know. Like, this is another one. That I think this is just your, you know, traditional 8-9 game that, unfortunately, um, I think whoever wins is probably staying for another game, and that's it, uh, because you're going to run into Gonzaga. Uh, this is a tough one because, I mean, we, we know kind of what you're getting from Oklahoma. Austin Reeves, he, he leads them in all the top three statistical categories, 17 points or about 18 points, six rebounds, five assists. Um, you know, Oklahoma, a Lon Kruger coach team, you kind of know what you're getting there. They really take care of the ball. They play, you know, somewhat of a, an efficient manner. Um, they You know, I, I like teams that aren't going to beat themselves in, in these kind of one-game settings here, win or go home. Um, they're not going to make a ton of mistakes, or at least they haven't statistically. Um, Oklahoma's not playing really well, though. Like, but I mean, Missouri's not either, right? So I think that's something, too. Oklahoma's lost four or five. They're kind of coming into this um, with not a lot, I think, to you know, kind of back them on. I mean, that what they beat Iowa State by six, and as we said, Iowa State was the worst power conference team in the country, uh, and they beat them in the Big 12 tournament by six, so they're not playing well at all. Um, and I, I worry about that a little bit for Oklahoma. Now, Missouri, you could say the same thing about they've what, I think they've won three of their last eight, uh, something like that. So they're struggling a bit too. Um, and this is, uh, I think this is a toss up for me. I, I don't know if you have a stronger opinion one way or the other, but for me, I, I kind of view this game as just uh, a toss up. I think the Lon Kruger aspect of it, and that's not to take anything away from Conzo Martin, but I always have a hard time betting against a, a Lon Kruger coach team in these kind of settings. Um, but this is, uh, this, this is a tough one. It's a tough call. Yeah, you beat me to my first point. I just don't like to bet against Lon Kruger. Um, and I'm trying to look up his NCAA tournament record if I can find that uh, as we speak. Th that's one big thing. The other thing, okay, Kruger's 21-19 and 19 in the NCAA tournament. So there's that. Um, 
the point I just made about the Big 12 being a better league than the SEC, uh, what I th- well, when I was talking about the SEC and the A-10, um, the degree of difference is less, but I, I do think that um, Big 12 just a little bit rougher league than the SEC is. And, and it does bother me that Oklahoma lost to Kansas State. I don't know how that happened. Yeah. And that's been within the last month. But, not but my, well. my, my, my gut ever since this has been announced – and you know the respect I have for Missouri. We've talked about that nonstop. My my gut ever since this matchup was announced was just, I just don't like it for Missouri. And I, I think I'm, I'm probably going to be hard-pressed to come off that. Now, look, I, I'm interested to see who guards Austin Reeves um, because Drew Smith it might be the guy that, that gets that. I, I don't know who they put him on. Um, you know, Oklahoma's got some other guys like Brady Manick who can score, but – I don't know. It, 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 the, it's the Lon Kruger thing for me that, that, that is kind of the deciding thing. And I, I just don't like to ever bet against that guy in a fairly even matchup, which I think this one is. Well, and I say they're not, you know, they've lost four or five, but let's, let's point this out too. You know, they lost to Oklahoma State by four in overtime, lost to Oklahoma State again by four. Um, they lost to Texas by four, and they lost to Kansas by seven. So, for, you know, outside of that Kansas State loss, which again we've seen some just outliers this year in terms of results, they've lost to some good teams and they've they've lost close games. That's like they've been blown out uh, at that. I'm kind of leaning your way. I I just think for me, I just didn't. I mean, I said it from the beginning. I didn't like Missouri's path at all. I thought they just got a terrible draw here. Um, you know, as I said, if I if it was me. I maybe flip Missouri and Florida in terms of that seven and nine spots, but uh, it is what it is now. You can't do that. And I just, I don't love the path at all for Missouri. I just don't like the matchup against, like you said, a Lon Kruger coach team that's coming in, not necessarily playing well, which means to me that he'll probably have them, you know, a little bit more focus rather than if they came in, you know, winners of eight in a row or something. Um, I think that he can kind of reset things and have them come in a bit more focused here and with Missouri, um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I feel like this is going to be a bit of a grind for both teams. I mean, statistically, there's a lot of similarities here with these two. Uh, but I, I'm kind of with you in that. I, I'm probably leaning a little bit more towards Oklahoma here. Do you think this is a game for Oklahoma where Corquath gets more of a role? I mean, he's kind of been their project big guy. He's good at blocks. They play him sparingly on some nights. But, you know, Jeremiah Tillman inside for Missouri – it's been a real weapon, and I'm really interested to to really see how he's used in this game. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, like Brady Manick, I mean, he's what, almost he's 6'9", and like he's going to have to play a big role in terms of what Tillman can do and, and those kind of things. But, I mean, this is, to me, this is a game where, and we've said it so many times, right, is if you're Oklahoma, like to me, that's priority number one. Like you want to you wanna try to get Jeremiah Tillman in foul trouble. If you can get him on the bench, if, if he's not on the floor – it's it's just different for Missouri. I mean, it's it's different, obviously, when he's not on the floor or Drew Smith isn't on the floor. Um, and so I, I think that's something I would expect immediately for Lon Kruger. Like, he's, you know, I have no doubt that they're going to try to just go right at him and be able to to try to get him in foul trouble. If they do, I think that really just sort of changes the, the dynamic for Missouri. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm not saying that I, I you know, this is, again, this is an 8-9 game for a reason, and I think it's going to be a pretty good game. I think the odds are, I think it's two point, Oklahoma's two point favorite in this one. So it's, it's going to be a good game. I'd be surprised if it's not, because I don't think either team is to the point of just completely, I don't know, just completely overwhelming the other to where, you know, it's like a 15 or 20 point game. I just don't think that's even a possibility, but um, I don't know. I'm I'm still just leaning towards Oklahoma because I think there's some things they could do to, to make things a little difficult on Missouri. I'm looking at the Ken Palm matchup. It's amazing how similarly these teams are. Yeah, statistically, there's a lot of similarities in what they do. So, and like they can, the uh, one can like counteract the other and certain things. Like it's just that there's a lot of things that sort of, you know, you, you could kind of look at and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's why. Um, you know, Missouri has more size. And that's what we talk about with Tillman. That can be important. They're two very experienced teams. I like that about both of them, um, which again, you know, maybe I like both of them in different matchups if they're not playing each other. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, um, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I don't, uh, you know, I don't know that a lot of people are going to be circling this one as, you know, just a game that, like we said, I don't think you're going to see a 95, 90 type game here or anything, but I think this is going to be a good basketball game between, between two good teams. And um, like I said, unfortunately, it's just uh, one of them has to go on to play the Zags. So. 
here's one other thing that's kind of concerning. Missouri is 40th in country in terms of getting its points from the line, as you can hear the thunder outside. Maybe that's our warning here. Um, <laughs> Oklahoma is 23% in terms of allowing free throws per field goals, which is 12th in the country. So Oklahoma, really good at keeping teams off the line. Here's another thing that's popped into my head as we've done this. How many times did we see Jeremiah Tillman? And I love the kid. He's a great story, great player, love the way he plays. But, man, he missed a lot of free throws down the stretch of games from Missouri that, that probably could have won them games this year, and that concerns me too. Yeah, not a great free throw shooting percentage for him individually. Um, you know, if you look at them, I guess as a team, you know, that's something else that kind of stands out is they're not a great free throw shooting team. Um, they're not a great three-point shooting team. Um, so those are the things that I think can come into play here. Um, they're in, you know, 220 or lower in both of those areas in terms of where they rank nationally. So that's something that, that would concern me a bit. I don't like that with teams specifically in these kind of games because, you know, we are expecting it to be a close game. We think this is going to be, you know, a probably five-point type game. I mean, I don't think it. it's just one of those that just gets out of hand at all. So can you make those kind of shots? Statistically, Missouri struggled a little bit doing that. I'm going with my gut and taking Oklahoma here. Yeah, I mean, I'll reserve the right to change my mind on this one until we get to, to Friday, but I, for right now, as a recording, I think I'm, I'm probably picking Oklahoma too. Okay, so five of the six we've decided, and, and we both agreed to punt on Florida till tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, so that's, a, that's another one. I think uh, I'm still sort of in wait-and-see mode on this one here, even though I'm kind of leaning Oklahoma and the Florida-Virginia Tech. I have no, no idea what to make of that one. Yeah. Blake, we had some coaching changes around the country. I guess nothing's happened with Frank Martin at South Carolina. You think he's probably there for another year at this point? Um, you know, this stuff's fast and furious in terms of kind of what what happens in terms of how quickly teams move on this. Um, this It's a tough one to call. It really is because I, I feel like that report came, what, on Sunday? And it's Wednesday now. I feel like there's there's got to be a situation where you should probably have a little clarity, especially knowing that there's been a lot of moves that are happening around the country. If you're South Carolina and you're going to make a move, you better hurry up and make it because um, a lot of these programs, you know, as we're seeing, if I mean, and, you know, you're not going to compare South Carolina to Indiana or uh, programs like that, but you know, Minnesota's open. Our Iowa state's about to fill theirs already. Um, you know, those kind of jobs are available. And so, it gets interesting um, well, deciding what they're going to do. As I said, if I'm South Carolina, uh, I just I don't think you make that move right now because I just think that it's going to be a situation to where if you make that move, you better have some idea of where you're going. If you don't, you're in trouble. Um, I think also Frank Martin, he's got a well, I think his buyouts. I don't remember exactly the specifics on. I think it's six million. I could be wrong. Um, which, you know, what South Carolina, I think, paid $13 million for Will, Will Muschamp or something like that. But I don't know. I, I'm curious. I think the longer this goes, obviously, you know, I'm not saying anything that's a, a shocker or anything, but as the longer it goes, I think he's going to be back because if you're South Carolina and you're going to make this move, you better hurry up and make it because uh, there's a lot of other jobs coming open. Yeah, there's 27 open as of this podcast, that according to ESPN.com. It's a count, I think, eight or nine have been filled already, which is – fast. <laughs> yeah. I guess a lot of these schools made a move knowing what they were going to do next. I guess the headliners, Richard Patino out at Minnesota lands at New Mexico. What the next day is New Mexico gets rid of Paul Weir. Um, Earl Grant has left Charleston to take the Boston college job. Charleston's had a really good history in that league uh, when Grant was there. So that anything else Standing out to you as you look at what's been done across the country, which, by the way, does not include any SEC teams so far. Well, I, just, I was going to bring this up. I forgot to. Eric Musselman is not leaving Arkansas for Minnesota. Can we please squash? Any, yeah, any I mean, rumors? I know he's from there, but I, I don't think I don't think I'd do that if I were here. I'm sorry, but that they are different jobs. Um, I just, yeah, I, I, I get it. I understand that you know the link with his dad and everything like i i completely understand the fact that you know he was there from there you know coach there all this other stuff uh bill muslin did but 
I just come on. Like I'm sorry. It's I, I would be I would be completely shocked if Eric Musselman up and leaves Arkansas, a program that he's now built into a top fifteen program in the country for a Minnesota program that quite frankly is near the bottom of the back t- back of the uh, Big Ten right now. Um, why would you do that? That's a I get the personal connection. But that is a complete lateral move when it comes to a, a pure professional uh, per standpoint, because it's just, again, why the path to the end. Well, this is one we, we could turn this podcast into a three hour podcast, probably. But the path to get to where, you know, you can be a top four seed or a top three seed or win a title. I mean, the SEC stronger, but I feel like the, the path to do that in the Big Ten based on where Minnesota is right now, that's a much harder climb than where you've gotten to with Arkansas. So. Arkansas is a weird job because I would never guess after Nolan Richardson was let go that this school would have been in, in a drought this long. Not that it's been bad, but I mean, Arkansas was, you know, along with Kentucky, one of the top two programs in the country, probably in the mid nineties. Yeah. Um, what they've not been to sweet 16 since is it 99 now? Uh, haven't won the conference. I don't think in that span at all. I mean, I would have never guessed that. So, and they've had some good coaches, right? I mean, Mike Anderson was good, for sure. It, it just didn't work out to the level they wanted it to. But I, I don't know. I think that this is the top 25 or top 20 job easily with the right guy who fits there. And I just think for whatever reason, he seems to be that. Well, and no disrespect to South Carolina, but that's what we talk about when you survey coaching jobs. Arkansas, South Carolina, completely opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of history, tradition, I think support, not only from a fan support standpoint, I got nothing against South Carolina fans, but I also think from maybe an administrative standpoint, that's something else. Um, So that's what I I mean. You know, Indiana, I know people are linking Muss and Nate Oates to Indiana for for that particular uh, point, but I I just don't, I don't see it. Like, I think these two have, these two have built, you know, national powers at the school they're currently at. Why would you leave to go to the really tough Big Ten which not to say the SEC is not tough, but and then try to start over there and do it again. Like it makes no sense to me. Um, so now look, money, money talks a lot of money. I get it. Like Indiana, rich tradition, all this other stuff. But I just don't. I don't see it. I think people sometimes just like we still, for some reason, on our national level, want to view the SEC schools at times as you know stepping stones to bigger jobs. But is is Indiana, which again I know we're an SEC podcast, but is Indiana, you know, still a? Uh, it's good. So they're going to hire someone great. I think it's probably going to be John Beeline if I had to make a guess right now. But I'm just very curious. Like uh, I don't know why you leave one place that's already set as a national power for another place that's trying to rebuild into that, and quite frankly, probably won't get there for two or three more years. So yeah, there is almost no chance if I were Eric Musselman that I would leave for Indiana. That job, as somebody put it. And I don't remember who they're on the verge of becoming Tennessee football. <laughs> the new, the new Gruden to Tennessee. So we'll see. But. Yeah. I mean, and I don't, I, I don't, I'd be lying if I told you, I totally understand it, but when's the last time Indiana won a national title was night one, one in what? 86 or 87. Is that it? I think that's right. I can. I can Here they beat Syracuse. Up, yeah. I, I don't. I mean, it, again, the tradition that I completely understand, um, that's a program, you know, that wants to win every single year. They, uh, I mean, we, we could have this hour long discussion on the Tom Crean era there. I've said it many times. Um, I mean, when, when Tom Crean took over that job, and by the way, uh, isn't it, isn't it interesting to think back now that Kelvin Sampson got fired there for what was it? Yeah. Um, sending text messages or a couple of extra calls or something. And he was just made out to be this ultimate villain. And now you kind of think of where things are. And I just, <laughs> I think you should just hire know, Kelvin Sampson, right? Like, just go hire him again. Because he was doing a great job there until he, um, you know, got fired for reasons that don't even come close to some of the reasons that are out there right now in college basketball. So, Crean won two big to- 10 titles. They were awful when he took over. Um, That's an understatement. Was, yeah, and he was 71 <laughs> and 91 in the big 10, but you, you take out the first three years and he's way above 500. Um, I don't know. It's just one of those jobs. Like you, some schools, you can't have like one bad year, although he, he had more than one beyond his control. And he did go seven and 11. Mike Davis got into the national championship game. I forgot about that. Oh, two. 
Yeah. yeah, I remembered that. They didn't win it, and yeah. that was kind of an unexpected. They were like, what, a five or a six maybe? I think they played Maryland. That was the year Maryland won it, yeah. Yeah, so that that was kind of a little bit of an aberration. But anyway, any any job ramifications for the SEC where you see an assistant leaving or something like that to one of these vacancies? Um, I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of good assistants. Like I know I'm trying to, well, that's, that's probably a podcast we could do based on, um, some of the guys that I'm trying to think off the top of my head, you know, I think Antoine Petway at Alabama. I mean, he's an Alabama guy though. I mean, eventually he's going to get some opportunities. I have no doubt about that. Uh, just based on, you know, the success he's had and just kind of how he's viewed uh, as someone, uh, but, uh, but like we said, I mean, you know, for him, is it, is it, you want to be a head coach probably at some point, but is it worth leaving a you know top 10 program to go do that right now? I don't know about that. Um, you know, if you look elsewhere, I mean, they're, they're going to continue, I think, to, to be different guys that, that'll be linked to, to probably different programs just from, from some of these. You know, Florida's always had assistants that have kind of uh, had opportunities to go in a lot of different directions. Um, you know, I think that those are just the ones you keep on. I, I think that's what you look at is that the teams that are near the top, like you're going to see some of those assistants get more opportunities. And, and by the way, I think a former Kentucky con- assistant could get uh, an opportunity, Kenny Payne. I think he'll be in the running for the uh, DePaul job. But of course, uh, Kenny Payne now, I think he's working as a, was it like an analyst he's or advisor, NBA advisor or for the Knicks or something? Oh, you know, maybe, yeah. Some kind of special it. job. I don't remember what the title is, but that those are ones that I would probably look at. Um, if you just think about it overall, I'm trying to think of anyone else. Uh, maybe. I'm trying to think, uh, you know, Tennessee's got a staff that I think that you could see a couple guys with it. Mike, Mike Schwartz is still on there. Uh, Kim English, th- those kind of guys, I think that you could see get opportunities at some point. But yeah, I don't, I don't know that anything immediately just kind of jumps out. So here's another interesting job. Uh, Utah, that one's open. Yeah. Larry K, the coach K of the West out. So yeah. And I, I think that was probably the right move there, but um, yeah. Who who ends up with that one? Because that's been a job. I mean, obviously they, you know, lost a national title game to Kentucky. Been been a been a few years now, but that's a program that's had a lot of success. Um, gosh, they've not been they've been to the tournament twice since 2009. Went back to back in 15, 16, and haven't been since. Um, after really, uh, gosh, mid 90s through mid 2000s, they were about as consistent as it came. Yeah. That's it's gonna be an interesting job because you know I think the certainly the the path in the Pac-12, um, which the Pac-12 has gotten stronger when you compare it to like the SEC and such. I think SEC is still ahead in terms of where things are at basketball conference wise. But I think when you look at it overall, um, you know the path to a Pac-12 championship, knowing that I don't know what Arizona is gonna do with Sean Miller, but I'm, well, I mean, listen, just, listening to the the Parish podcast at CBS, they, they were saying that you know if you read closer to the allegations that that Miller was never directly implicated now okay whatever uh and maybe that's an important point but sometimes you you have assistants and other people do things that you have plausible deniability I mean look it, it didn't work for Rick Patino in the end that excuse didn't so um the Utah yeah, job I, though it's I, just, I, just crazy yeah it, it's crazy the atmosphere we live in where like we, we've still got Will Wade on a wiretap and he is coaching in the NCAA tournament and recruiting at a high level as if nothing ever happened. I don't know. This coaching carousel is going to be interesting because I think there's still a lot to figure out here in terms of um, what we could see uh, with, with a lot of these. And look, like we said, if South Carolina makes a move, then that all of a sudden makes things a lot more interesting in the SEC. You know, do they turn to someone like Pat Kelsey or, or someone like that? I don't know. But um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. So, a lot of dominoes starting to fall on the uh, the coaching carousel. When's the last time the SEC went a year without a coaching vacancy? Um, that is a good question. I'm gonna look at this here. Who? Let's see. Last year, who was last year? Might have been. Was it? Did anyone lose their job last year? No, I don't think so. So maybe last year. But I feel like that probably would have been the first time in a while, right? So, because the year before that, I think the dominoes started falling the years before that. But I think last year would have been the only one. So this, yeah, because we didn't have a first year head coach, which, as we said, I think with the circumstances too, not surprised by that. So yeah, I mean, obviously it was pandemic related, but I don't know who would have. No one was really on the hot seat last year because no, you, because yeah. a lot of the guys that had bad years were in their second or third year. Right. Um, 
you know, in, in situations that were understandable. So, yeah, yeah. I'm guessing that won't be the case next year. Probably not, because I think that's, I'm sure we'll have a podcast on that. But I think you'll you'll have some discussion start heating up. If I had to pick right now, I'm not going to say the specific. That'd be, we use that as a teaser. I think you're going to see some discussion pick up in one, two, three, four, five. I'm I'm looking at five right now that could, under interesting circumstances, start to maybe have that discussion a little bit deeper next season. Yeah, I have a feeling we'd be on the same page about a lot of those. So, yeah. Uh, by the way, transfer portal. I know Vanderbilt yesterday lost Educate Ben and DJ Harvey, Max Evans to the portal. Um, Auburn lost. Who was it? Uh, couple, Justin Powell. Justin yeah. Powell. And somebody else hit the portal the other day. Good luck trying to keep up with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because we don't have enough to follow right now, right? Yeah, I was going to say. I, I've seen, seen some of them. If there's somebody else that's transferred, uh, uh, good luck trying to figure out who it is because it's it's not easy to uh, to keep up with. I, I will I will tell you that. I think uh, Cameron Fletcher, Kentucky, that was not a surprise, though. That's who it was. So, That's who it was. Yeah. So no, he didn't didn't play a ton. So might, might have a transfer portal episode coming up no. on the 14th at some point. No probably, doubt. Probably yeah. after the season. And by the way, we got baseball coming up. Uh, we got a summary of Tuesday night's action that's going up on the site here in a bit. It'll be up by the time you hear this uh, for 99% of you. We will have some power rankings come up. Barry and I have been working on that uh, the last couple of days. I think we'll put that up for Thursday for baseball. Of course, baseball play starts in the conference on Friday, I guess. Um, I don't know if there's a Thursday game. I need to check that. But point is, conference baseball starts this season or th- this weekend, too. So, man, a lot going on. It's hard to keep up. Yeah, there's a lot happening. I know, like I said, this, this episode's a little longer. We're trying to, to make up for our, our Tuesday episode there. And, uh, yeah, it's... I don't know. By the way, Nate Oates just uh, made the Final Four for um, Coach of the Year finalists. No surprise. I think uh, right there with Mark Few, Scott Drew, Juwan Howard. So I can't say I'm shocked by that. Brad Underwood deserved to be in that conversation? Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess. But I mean, look, and I don't mean that in a mean way, but like I think Oates belongs in that top four because – I mean, the expectations for Alabama were not as high as Illinois. And, you know, I think that, that he absolutely belongs in there because he just, look, I mean, Alabama was what they picked. They're big fifth in the SEC, and they're the number two seed in the tournament and the SEC's best team. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think you, you can't keep it. You can't leave out few Drew, and I think you can't leave out Jawan Howard either. So I think I'm fine yeah. with those four. But yeah, well, I, I mean, that's an elite award. So yeah. four is going to leave out some guys that had great years. Underwood has been more of a slower build with Illinois. The first two years were kind of rough. Uh, and last yeah. year was OK. And then this year was. Uh, the, so I, I think that's the other thing. No, Oates was two years behind him. So I can't argue with that for yeah. sure. Right. And, and Juwan Howard, of course, um, green, too. So, yeah. Anyway, Blake, anything else before we wrap up today? No, be sure to check out the Bracket Challenge. Uh, we'll have the link up to that. Uh, we may even just put up a post on the website to make it easier to access it to um, southeastern14.com. Just find our Twitter, 14 Southeastern, and uh, we'll have the link. We'll, we'll probably just pin that to the top of our Twitter. So be sure to, to join in on the Bracket Challenge. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. I know we're, we're thinking about working on a prize here that, that may be something that will intrigue some of you as well. Um, so, yeah, just just join the Bracket Challenge. It's always fun to kind of uh, have some, some fun or interaction like that as we go throughout the tournament. Um, so uh, you can, yeah, join all the great people in there thus far, already getting some uh, people filling out their brackets. So, yeah, be sure to do that. Be sure and visit the website, southeastern14.com. You can get all our podcasts there. You can also get them probably just about any place where you get your podcasts. If you would, please rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, follow us on 14southeastern.com at Twitter. And, of course, uh, boring technical difficulties, which I don't think will be an issue tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, We will be back with another podcast. May talk some baseball. But in any case, we'll be back with something compelling. I hope you will listen. For Blake Lovell, I'm Chris Lee. Thank you for listening to Wednesday's episode of The 14th.